and I hopefully other people that I will be meeting um, this year. I've um, been around most of England and most of Scotland. I've still got most of Wales and all of Ireland to do, so there's still a bit to, bit to go. Um, I'm off to Cardiff next week, so uh, Wales is uh, um, in my sights and Ireland is also in my sights this summer. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you and um, take you through uh, the presentation. Um, so uh, I know there's a little bit of a lag between what I'm seeing and what you're seeing, but hopefully something will be appearing shortly. And um, this is kind of the type of thing which I'm interested in. This is um, a fabulous giant redwood, uh, which is in um, a suburb of Bristol, um, which has been left uh, to grow in situ um, near these houses. And it sort of typifies, I think, um, the types of trees that I'm interested in and also highlights how we've sort of value these trees, how we've protected them and built houses around them, something which doesn't happen so often these days, perhaps something which uh, we've done more in the past. Um, so uh, I'm just going to move on to the next slide, which is starting at the beginning. Um, so this uh, is uh, one that is hopefully appearing for you now. It's a horse chestnut, a rather small diminutive horse chestnut, um, which uh, surprisingly perhaps is um, what I'm calling the northernmost horse chestnut. And I discovered this in Lerwick in the Islands. Um, this is flowering horse chestnut from the Balkans. It's native to Greece and Albania, growing in perhaps the northernmost part of the British Isles uh, in Lerwick. Um, Lerwick has a surprising number of trees and there'll be one or two that will feature uh, in my book. Um, and uh, to find a, most of them are sycamores, I must say, and sycamores are something which uh, we'll come on to in a, in, in a bit more detail. But a flowering horse chestnut in Lerwick. This is against the wall of Fort Charlotte, which is the um, 18th century fort that uh, the military built in uh, Lerwick, overlooking the um, sound there. Um, if anybody knows Lerwick, go and check it out. Um, being so far north, this was uh, probably in late June that this was flowering. So um, in, in London, they're over already. Um, head to Lerwick later next month to catch them still in flower. Um, moving ever so slightly south, uh, my next tree is, um, well, actually it's considerably further south. This is uh, 100 miles or more south. And um, this is a sycamore that grows in the main street in Kirkwall on the Orkney Islands. And um, this is known as the big tree. Um, the big tree is not particularly big by most British standards, but by Orcadian standards, this is fairly large. It's also fairly old. Um, it's been in Kirkwall for as long as anybody can remember. It could be 200 years old. Um, it's hollow, and you can just about see in this picture, I think, uh, a steel rod which uh, holds the thing upright. It's thriving nevertheless, and it's in this particularly urban uh, environment. They're right in the middle of uh, Kirkwall, not far from St Magnus's Cathedral, if anybody knows Kirkwall, um, of which also has some quite good trees around it. This is a sycamore. Um, sycamores grow throughout Britain. They are perhaps the most common tree uh, in these islands. They seem to thrive absolutely everywhere in virtually every condition and particularly in Scotland and in Northern England there are some magnificent examples of, of sycamores. You may feel that sycamores are something which uh, they have a bit of a bad press I think but I'm going to show you some fantastic sycamores. Um, my next tree isn't a sycamore. Um, I'm still in Scotland um, and this is um, a Scots pine, um, and this is on the beach at Loch, which is outside Aviemore. 
if anybody knows uh, that. It's a tremendous uh, place that's become this uh, water sports centre. Uh, has a sandy beach uh, and is surrounded by a remnant of the Caledonian forest, which is a wonderful uh, type of woodland, uh, which um, is largely composed of large old Scots pines. And this is one of them, which is a remnant on the beach. It's now surrounded by plantation pines, but you can see this fantastic shape of this pine, which has a huge amount of space to grow in. And there are lots of these around Aviemore, but this one, the Morlick pine, as I'm calling it, I think is uh, a particularly wonderful example and is in a particularly prominent, nearly urban situation certainly one which is very accessible. Uh, this one, again, I think is over 200 years old. Uh, the Scots pines in these parts of the ancient Caledonian remnants uh, tend to have been, uh, tend to be no more than about 200 years old, um, just because they will have been logged at certain points throughout the, uh, their history, um, and many have been lost, but there are a significant num number of these magnificent trees left. Uh, my next tree, is uh, actually further north. I'm, I'm going to be scooting around a bit. Um, so I started off with this plan that I was going to go north to south. Um, and the book probably will be uh, set out in this way, but uh, uh, I'm going to chop and change a bit in this presentation. So I mentioned the sycamore, and this is one of the wonderful Scottish sycamores um, that I talked about. This is the Bewley sycamore, which is at Bewley Abbey, which is just north of Inverness. Um, it's a fantastically huge sycamore. Um, it has this girth-like further south you might, you might expect with an ancient oak tree. Uh, this tree um, is associated with Mary Queen of Scots, as many old trees in Scotland are. So old sycamores and old sweet chestnuts particularly often have an association with uh, Mary Queen of Scots. Um, Bewley has many associations with her. In fact, it was named by her. Uh, she uh, said it had a beautiful view, and it does, over the Bewley Firth going out towards Inverness. Um, as well as the uh, Bewley Sycamore, what I've discovered is that often when you find a great tree, another one pops up nearby. In this case, I was a little late. At Bewley, until recently, there was also a magnificent witch elm, um, which unfortunately succumbed to Dutch elm disease, uh, but the remnants of it have been left. And this is the Bewley witch elm, uh, which won't appear in the book, I have to say, because I'm, I'm going to focus on trees which are extant. Uh, but behind it, you can see the Bewley sycamore, so very close together. And this is a pattern which has cropped up in my research, is that when you find one tree, there is often another, if not more than one, nearby. Sometimes there's a bit of a struggle for me to work which one to put in. I should say that uh, I've been limited to a thousand trees, which is still a lot because they would be geographically spread around the country. But uh, I, in some places I could put in half a dozen uh, within a hundred meters of one another. Um, I was talking about trees being extant and my rushing around the country uh, looking for these trees has meant that occasionally I've been too late, as, uh, as we saw at Bewley. Uh, this next tree is one that I was lit at the point where I arrived the day they were going to cut it down, unbeknown to me. This is um, a very popular and much loved weeping beech in the old cemetery in Norwich. And um, it was one that uh, had been recommended me to me to go and have a look at. I arrived there to find this tree gang ready to cut it down. Um, apparently it was uh, very diseased, it's very diseased and um, was considered unsafe. I was very fortunate to meet uh, Norwich's tree officer while I was there who explained all the details of what was wrong with it to me and also pointed out some fantastic alternative trees I could find in Norwich. Uh, which I won't share with you now, you'll have to wait for those, but there are, Norwich uh, is a great place for trees, uh, and uh, I've got at least a dozen trees in Norwich to um, uh, share with you at another time. Sometimes 
again, I'm just in time. Um, the next tree uh, is a tree which is very much in its final years, I'd say. Uh, and this is a Southern Catalpa or Indian bean tree, which is um, in St. Mary's Church in Reading. Um, this is a, a much loved tree again. Often these trees are landmarks. Uh, this is a landmark next to the bus stops in Reading. Um, it uh, has been much pollarded over the years. It's um, looking rather uh, forlorn. Uh, just in behind it is a, is a replacement for that tree, another uh, southern catalpa that's been planted to uh, replace it. it. What my research has also sort of shown me is the very different ages that trees will live to. So this um, Indian bean tree or southern catalpa is probably less than 200 years old. Um, often uh, other larger trees would be um, looking like this and would be much, much, much older. So for instance, sycamores, oaks and sweet chestnuts, you could expect to be several hundred years old and yews, like the one behind me, can live for thousands. So the anchor wit yew, uh, which you may be able to see some rather garish blue cabling in it, uh, is the tree under which the Magna Carta was signed in 1289. I'm guessing, I can't quite remember the date. Um, my next tree is one that um, has been replaced. So I think that this is, a, this is a sort of moment to think about whether a tree should be included uh, in its original form or whether a next iteration of a tree has as much importance. And this um, is the six penny tree in Edinburgh. Um, it's a small leaved lime tree and it's at least the second iteration of this tree uh, on that spot. It's called the six penny tree because it's where um, people that worked in the paper mills on the water of Leith, which is nearby, paid their six penny dues um, to the union that uh, looked after them, an early union. So it was a meeting point, a tree that acted as uh, the landmark where people would meet. Um, it obviously has this resonance in local history and so on. It's regarded as important and has been replaced. And here it is sitting in the middle of the road next to a uh, busy road um, on the eastern, uh, western outskirts of Edinburgh. Now, I mentioned uh, sycamores and I've shown you the great sycamore in um, Bewley. And I also mentioned that often two trees are next to each other or very close together. And my next is a pair that are actually, or maybe one of them is very well known. Um, the tree in the foreground is another fantastic old sycamore. It's another Scottish sycamore. And this is at Dunkeld in Perthshire. Um, this is the Burnham sycamore. And just beyond it is the Burnham oak. The Burnham oak is uh, very well known, um, has the association with Burnham wood, which of course uh, features in Macbeth uh, and is perhaps the last remnant of the Burnham forest. I, I won't um, recite the line from that as I can't remember it apart from anything else, but um, uh, the Burnham Wood, um, a few remnants of it on the River Tay, just outside, um, on the south side of on the river in Burnham, which is on the uh, southern bank of the Tay, opposite Dunkeld, um, the sycamore and the oak. Um, the oak is impressive, but the sycamore is even more impressive. Um, both these trees have interpretation panels next to them. The oak has a large interpretation panel giving you all its history, the history of um, the Burnham Woods, um, the history of its association with uh, Shakespeare and so on, uh, speculation about how many centuries this tree has been there. The sycamore has an interpretation panel as well, but it's about a quarter of the size of the oak uh, panel and uh, it's very dismissive and suggests that it is um, considerably younger than the oak tree and that it's um, maybe something that we should disregard because it's not a native tree. Um, these attitudes 
I find uh, slightly uh, alarming perhaps. And I hope that one of the things that, we, that this book might be able to do is eventually uh, make us change our views of uh, uh, these types of trees, which maybe come from uh, outside off these shores and how we should celebrate them as these great um, natural landmarks within the environment, uh, regardless of uh, their provenance. Um, my next tree is yet another Scottish tree, and um, we'll be moving on back into England again soon. But um, this is a fabulous old um, sweet chestnut tree. There are quite a few old sweet chestnut Scotland, um, often, as I mentioned earlier, associated with Mary Queen's, Queen of Scots. This is in the little town, the little suburb almost of Dunipace, which is connected to Denny on the outskirts of Falkirk. Just behind here is the M80. You stand here and you can hear the roar of the motorway not far away. And you can look at this magnificent multi-centurion tree, which is at least 500 years old. It's known as the King Tree. It has several other names as well. Um, it's essentially on the edge of uh, a housing estate, between a housing estate and the motorway. Uh, the street that it's on is called Chestnut Crescent. So it has been preserved, memorialized, and it has an interpretation panel as well. Um, the um, chestnuts from this um, do ripen, and uh, some local people have actually planted them and are growing replacement trees for it. Uh, they'll have to be quick though, because uh, I imagine this tree doesn't have that much longer. That's relatively quick. It could have another couple of centuries in it, of course. Um, but it's a fascinating tree, um, one that should be on anybody's uh, Scottish itinerary. Um, moving on again, um, I've moved next to Dundee. And from here, I'm going to talk about trees which have an association with a place and uh, have been named after the place they come from. Uh, so this is Camperdown Park, which is on the northern fringes of uh, Dundee, a former stately home now, uh, and Parkland associated with that, now owned by the city council, uh, within which uh, can be found the original Camperdown Elm. Camperdown Elms are these strange, low domes. You occasionally see them in churchyards often. Um, they have a very distinct silhouette. This one is nearly 200 years old. Um, it's grown hardly anything. Remarkably, this is the original. Um, it's hidden away. You have to hunt it out. A hint is that it's quite close to the little zoo within Camperdown Park. Um, it is tiny. Um, most Camperdown elms that you will find uh, planted in churchyards or wherever have been grafted onto witch elm stock and they are much higher than these ones because they have that um, uh, straight trunk stock on which they've been crown grafted. This one has no grafting so it literally has hardly expanded uh, at all and you can just see by the size of the trees around it. Uh, it's a really remarkable uh, little thing. So every Camperdown Elm, which you can find anywhere in the world, is a scion of this tree. Um, and it's from Dundee. So urban trees have given the world these uh, cultivars which have traveled um, in their wake. This, uh, there's a magnificent example of these in, in Brooklyn, um, for instance. You can find them I know of one in uh, St Pancras uh, Old Church Yard as well in London. Uh, th they're scattered across the British Isles and further afield as well. And they come from Dundee. Um, the next tree which I want to share with you is another uh, tree which has taken its name from the place that it's come. And it's an urban place. Um, you may recognise, uh, I'm hoping the uh, image will be appearing shortly for you. Um, you should recognize Edinburgh Castle. And the tree which I want to highlight here is the one with the golden foliage in the foreground. And this is in Princess Street Gardens. Um, and it's a 
Christophin Plain. Um, that is a cultivar of the sycamore. Again, the sycamore does brilliantly in Scotland. And you may be able to see a graft mark at the base of the trunk on this one. The Castorfin Plain comes from the Edinburgh suburb of Castorfin. Um, there used to be a castle there in which several hundred years ago this tree arose. Um, it has become a fairly common cultivar in Edinburgh, but it's got further afield as well. And my next picture is a, an image of a Castorfin Plain um, in its pomp. They're at their best in March. They come into leaf earlier than most trees. And this is perhaps their, um, what's so exciting about them um, or what was so exciting about them for Victorian horticulturalists. Um, and you occasionally find them in parks and landscapes, um, a lot in Edinburgh, but elsewhere as well. This one is in Sheffield's Botanic Gardens. Uh, I caught it in March last year. Um, it's looking absolutely lovely here, and you can see probably what it was that um, the Victorians loved about this. They're now a rather rare cultivars. They're considered not as glamorous or as obvious as some other cultivars. Um, so uh, quite one to, to seek out, and particularly at a, at a specific time of year. So um, from uh, Sheffield Botanic Gardens, and take you to another botanic gardens and another um, city tree. This botanic gardens is uh, one of the most historic in uh, Britain. Um, this is Birmingham Botanic Gardens, uh, which was laid out by Loudon in the early 19th century. Um, and it plays host to a fantastic collection of trees, um, one of which is a Birmingham elm. Now, have you ever heard of a Birmingham elm? This is a Birmingham elm. It's a rather small tree, um, and it's uh, an elm tree which actually the um, cultivar name is usually uh, called Jacqueline Hillier, named after uh, one of the Hillier um, clan, the great horticulturists have spanned generations and still going strong in Hampshire. Um, but the original tree from which this cultivar is the, um, is a scion and every Jacqueline Hillier cultivar is a scion, a rose in a front garden in Selly Oak in Birmingham in, and was discovered in the 1930s. Here's one in the Birmingham Botanic Gardens. Others can be found elsewhere. It's a remarkable urban tree with a, a city uh, name associated with it. My next one is another tree which has an, is particularly urban in that it is, it comes from a town. Um, this is one of the oldest um, and uh, most lovely of the Luckham Oaks. So uh, many of you may have heard of a Luckham Oak. A Luckham Oak was uh, named after, was it William Luckham or A. Luckham, who uh, had a nursery in Exeter uh, in the 18th century and um, crossed uh, or hybridized a cork oak with a turkey oak. Uh, this came known as the oak. It's a semi evergreen tree. I caught this one, which is outside Devon County Hall uh, in March this year. Um, when it at the one moment when Luckham oaks have no leaves on them, um, Exeter is full of them. It's a tree which comes from Exeter. There are two other trees which come from Exeter as well. There's an Exeter elm, a cultivar of witch elm. And there's also uh, Veitch's magnolia, which is a particular magnolia, which again arose in Exeter. So Exeter is another city which has these uh, trees associated with these very specific And there's a story which I hope I'll be able to unfold a bit more in the book. Um, moving from Exeter to another great urban oak, a Luckham oak in that case, and this one um, is in a park in Manchester. This is Longford Park, and this is a red oak. And this is one of the oldest red oaks I've uh, discovered on my travels. That's Quercus rubra. The red oak comes from North America. It's been here for several centuries. Um, you often find them, they're not particularly rare trees, but this is one of the oldest and most magnificent I've discovered. Um, Longford Park is a public park in South Manchester. 
Um, it was the site, like many public parks, of a former landscape, an uh, aristocratic house, a parkland, a garden. And sometimes you'll find magnificent old trees that have been saved from those former uh, environments that now reside in these park, these public parks that predate the parks. Um, and those trees are often very interesting. Um, I hope to find more and with your help, I may. Um, staying in Manchester, this is the outskirts of Manchester. This is actually uh, in Timperley, uh, just on the edge of Altrincham. And this is, I thought I'd get some flowers in, some flowering trees. Uh, and this is a wonderful, Accolade cherry. Um, this is a, a cultivar of uh, one of the Japanese ornamental cherries, and this is the um, biggest example I've ever seen. Uh, my cousin, fortunately, lives nearby and uh, took this photograph for me earlier this year. Uh, really fantastic tree. This is the champion accolade cherry. Accolades are an early flowering variety of. Um, uh, ornamental cherry uh, and they have these pinkish white flowers which appear before the leaves. Um, different cherry cultivars, uh, there are dozens of them, uh, I'm never going to be able to cover all of them in the book but I'm certainly going to be able to some different ex brilliant examples of uh, various cherry types. My next one is in Plymouth and this is a rather fabulous um, cherry and a, a lovely cultivar, one of my favourite cherry varieties. This is uh, Taihaku or the Great White Cherry. This is um, one of the um, Japanese cultivars that is associated, or this one particularly is associated with uh, Captain Collingwood Ingram. Uh, any read the great book by uh, Naoko Abe about Collingwood Ingram and uh, the cherries that uh, he saved for the Japanese, in a sense, um, in um, Sussex. Uh, this is the one that uh, was became extinct in Japan and was taken back to Japan, having survived in Sussex. It has the largest flowers of any of the ornamental cherry varieties. It's not particularly common, but when you come across them, when they're in flower, they are truly magnificent. And this is a really splendid example of one in uh, the city centre in uh, Plymouth. Um, another prunus that I'm going to share with you um, is this uh, rather fabulous uh, almond tree, prunus dulcis. Almonds are uh, related to the cherries and have fabulous blossom early in the season. Uh, almond blossom appears from um, around March or actually sometimes earlier, February, and this tree, which is actually quite close to where I live in North London, is um, what I regard as the benchmark uh, almond. And um, it has this fabulous pink blossom, which appears sometimes as early as um, Jan late January. Um, but what's also remarkable about it is this corkscrew trunk that it has, um, which I'm I sort of walk past this tree quite regularly. I always wonder how did it get this uh, amazing trunk. Um, there are other trees that have amazing uh, contours and my next tree is another one which uh, may be familiar to some of you. Um, it's a tree which uh, was a shortlist for England's tree of the year uh, two or three years ago and this is an example of uh, a twisted pine in Norfolk. This is a Thetford. Um, so North Norfolk, the Breckland area of Norfolk, is famed, perhaps, maybe not to everybody, but uh, for those um, in the tree appreciation world, it's famed for its twisted pines. Historically, pines, Scots pines typically, were planted as um, field boundaries. Um, in the late 18th and early 19th century, and they were coppiced or, or pollarded um, as other hedging plants might have been. But pines really don't work, doesn't work for pines that. So now you have these incredible contoured pines all over the North Norfolk landscape. And this one at uh, Thetford has this really particular um, twisted um, 
bowl which has turned into actually a complete uh, corkscrew and this is perhaps the most interesting one it's uh, very, just on the edge of Thetford um, you could walk to it from Thetford town centre. Um, I'm going to move to another tree which has been propped up or through human intervention and has this rather fantastic uh, shape and this is another London tree. Um, this one is one that uh, I think everybody uh, in London will be going to visit uh, after next Tuesday when uh, Crossrail, the Elizabeth Line, uh, opens uh, because this can be found near Abbey Wood. That is the Nursby Mulberry. Um, it's a fantastic tree, has been for at least 100 years. Uh, Peter Coles, who met some of may know, who Mulberry X has uh, written about this tree and uh, he um, was gave me some information about uh, how long it's been there and so on but it's younger than it looks and this is something which is typical of mulberries you often find old mulberries which become uh, quite prostrate as they get older but uh, as Peter said this one is little more than 200 years old even though you could mistake it for being hundreds of years old and could be one of those original mulberry introductions for the um, nascent uh, silk industry that never happened uh, that James the first stroke the sixth introduced to uh, England. Um, from one propped tree I'm going to go to another propped tree and this is a rather rarer type of tree so I'm hoping to cover some particularly unusual species as well, some species that you might not uh, recognize. Um, and this tree uh, is actually in Derby Arboretum, another Loudoun landscape and um, uh, arguably uh, the oldest public park in England. There are several which vie for that attention. It was opened in 1840. Uh, it was Loudoun's uh, last landscape and it's a rather small but rather perfectly formed um, public park known as an arboretum and as such it has a series of mounds which run through it with plant with trees planted on top some of which date back to 1840 including this one which is a Turkish hazel perhaps the oldest Turkish hazel um, that, that I've come across 180 years old or a little older um, Turkish hazels are now quite frequently planted as street trees uh, but uh, they're very unusual to find them this old. That's Corylus calerna, if anybody wants the Latin name for it. And you can see the props which have been added to this. Derby Arboretum has many uh, fantastic trees. This is just one that I've picked out. Uh, I'm going to be hard pressed to choose one tree from Derby Arboretum. Another rare tree uh, which I thought I'd bring your attention to, uh, which are scattered all over cities. Cities, I think, are in a way the repository of uh, really diverse tree flora. You often find unusual trees in cities. You're more likely to find them in cities than you are anywhere else, perhaps. Um, and these are often outside public collections and so on. This tree is an Amur maple, Asa ginella, a rather lovely um, type of maple, rather unusual, quite a small maple. And this is in Hull. Um, this is in, uh, in front of some council housing that was built after the Second World War. It's probably the same age as the buildings behind it. It's a not particularly old tree, but it's a rather unusual tree. And it's a great example of um, this species. And to find it in an unlikely place in Hull, I think is quite remarkable. So this is the type of tree I'm interested in. Um, Hulls. Acer ginella or Amor maple. Across the road is Pearson Park. If anybody knows Park, Hull, uh, Pearson Park is a wonderful park, Hull's oldest park, full of fantastic trees, including the largest small leaved lime I've ever seen. So just across the road from this rare Amor maple, two trees for the price of one. Um, another one of England's oldest parks that also vies for the attention of uh, advised for that title of being England's oldest public park is Victoria Park in Bath. 
and um, that was open. That was named after uh, Queen uh, Queen Victoria before she was queen, when she was a uh, princess. It was opened in 1837, but unlike Derby, the public weren't admitted. Uh, so it's older than Derby Arboretum, but it's not necessarily a public park. Having said that, it is public now, and there's some fantastic trees to be seen there, including this very rare uh, Caucasian um, Zelkova, uh, which is just by the Victoria Gate of Victoria Park in Bath. A wonderful tree with a fantastic silhouette. Uh, you occasionally find them. I will highlight a few of these, but uh, this one in Bath is one of my favourites. There's another great one in uh, Hyde Park as well in London, if anybody knows that. Um, one of my last trees, I'm thinking we might need to be thinking about um, getting to some questions and hopefully some suggestions as well. Um, this is another rare tree um, that you will find in a public park. And this is in Central Parks in Southampton. And this is a Jellicote pine or Jeffcoat pine. I can't quite remember, but it's a lovely uh, ornamental pine that you very rarely see. And this is um, a really fantastic and striking example in uh, these gardens right in the center of Southampton. And there's all dozens of interesting trees to be found in this uh, garden as well. But this one I think is the most striking. I'm hoping that through uh, some of the trees which I'm gonna be able to introduce you to, some of these lesser known species, that it might inspire people to plant them more um, frequently because they certainly deserve it. And this tree, this species is one that I don't think I've ever seen another example of one. Uh, uh, so in the center of Southampton. Um, I advertised this uh, talk uh, on Twitter, at least on Facebook, and some of you may have followed those links by highlighting this wonderful tree, which is in Canterbury. And uh, this is a Baobab plain. Um, Baobab plains are a cultivar of London plains. Uh, London plains uh, will feature in the book, but I particularly like these ones, which have these huge fat bowls, a relatively short for London plains. Uh, and Canterbury has quite a few of them. Um, there's a great blog post by um, uh, Sadie Freeman, if anybody has seen that. So search for the Baobab Plains of Canterbury. And it, it, it highlights how these trees have, were planted in the 19th century, probably by the uh, nurseryman William Masters, who had a nursery in Canterbury. And he was a very religious man. And uh, if you plot them on a map, they form a cross in the city in the center of Canterbury, one of which is outside the cathedral. This one is in Westgate Gardens. This is the uh, best example, I think. And in fact, probably the best example of this rare tree to be found um, in Britain. There are others, there are quite a few in London. Uh, there's one in Ravenscourt Park in Hammersmith, which I think is uh, vies for the attention of best um, uh, Baobab Plain. There are others elsewhere in the country. Um, mostly in the southeast of England, but uh, this one um, is outside a pub in Carlisle. Um, this is a Baobab Plain uh, right up there in Cumbria. Um, London Plains and Plains generally um, tend to be reaching uh, the, the most northerly edges of, their, um, of where they find it comfortable. Um, there are some good examples of plane trees in Edinburgh, and I've seen one or two in Dundee, but further north than that, I haven't really seen a plane tree. A Baobab plane in Carlisle is quite amazing, I think. Suggests it could uh, have got, they could get further, uh, further north, I mean, but also this is an outlier. So there's a mystery as to how these Baobab planes got planted uh, generally. When were they planted? Uh, how were they um, marketed? Uh, who planted them. Um, they're often seen as individual or single trees. They're often associated with um, churchyards. This one's in a pub. Um, it's a single one. It's in Carlisle. It's hundreds of miles from the nearest other tree. How did it get there, I wonder? This book is going to have loads of mysteries in it as well, I'm afraid. Um, so I think that is about my final tree. 
Um, if you know of any, I'd love to hear them hear from you. Um, please get in touch uh, via my website, thestreettree.com. Uh, you could even email me on this dedicated hotline I've set up, greaturbantrees at gmail.com, or get in touch with me through social media at The Street Tree. The tree um, that I'm showing you here is a um, Catalpa ovata, a yellow Catalpa related to the Indian bean tree. This one is from Asia. And this is a humble street tree in the center of Nottingham, another rare tree and uh, one which has yellow flowers, unlike um, the regular Southern Catalpa, which has white flowers. Um, right. Plug for some of my books. Neil very kindly mentioned that uh, London is a Forest, one of my books is going into a second edition. Uh, it's due out later this month. Um, if you want to buy them, you can buy them from my website, thestreettree.com. Um, and I think with that, we'll uh, call it a day. <laughs>